Hi folks, it's Professor Cohn, and this is the first of the recorded lectures on uh, the readings for HE111W. Um, this week we are looking at three short stories, um, uh, one of them a prose poem by the American poet Robert Hass, um, one of them a short story by the uh, very well-known short story writer John Cheever, and the third, uh, a story by a uh, woman named Mary Hood. Um, this is the second of the online lectures that I've recorded for classes at the Academy, and um, I apologize if uh, they are, are not super well produced, um, and I also apologize because it's mostly just going to be my head talking to you for 15 or 25 minutes. Uh, but I will try to keep it brief, and I will try to make some points about the stories and raise some questions uh, for you to think about that we might talk about in our discussion groups. So let me talk about the first one uh, that you've been asked to read, and that's Robert Hass's A Story About the Body. Um, this is a really wonderful piece. It's in a collection of poems called Human Wishes, and it is technically what's called a prose poem. That may seem like a contradiction in terms, right? Prose is... Um, what you get with fiction or nonfiction writing, um, poetry is verse. It's got line breaks, etc. But Hass is noted as a poet, and this is a paragraph-length story, um, but it is very, very conscious of its own language and very conscious of its own images, and maybe more so than a typical work of fiction, which is why we can call it a prose poem. When you, when you take a look at that story, um, one of the first things that you might notice after the, the sort of initial disturbance that you might feel um, at the ending of it, uh, notice the two characters and notice the ways that Hass describes them and the ways in which Hass uh, opposes them. So we have the young composer. Uh, he's male. Um, can't say for sure if he's white, but I think given that, that Hass himself is white um, and given that the opposite character is Asian, is Japanese, um, I think we can maybe presume he's a sort of stand-in for Hass. The other character is the Japanese woman. She's a painter and she's nearly 60. And the story is a rather simple one. It's about their budding romance while they are together at an artist's colony and about a turning moment in their lives. Um, as, you, as you read it, uh, you should pay attention to the way the two characters are quite different and, and the way in which you yourself react to the prospect of a romantic relationship between a young man and a woman nearly 60 in age um, is actually an important reaction to pay attention to. Um, if you feel disgusted or put off by that, ask yourself why. Um, what is it about her uh, that is, for you, um, troubling? Uh, because obviously the young composer is drawn to her. You might also think about why he is drawn to her, what the story reveals about that. But you also need to pay attention to the language in the story. And one of the things that you can notice right away is it is very poetic. It's a rather beautiful, um, well-described piece. But if you read it aloud, you'll notice right in the middle when the two characters have a bit of dialogue, that's when the quality of the language changes drastically. And that also occurs at exactly the moment that uh, a climax is reached in terms of their relationship. And it's when the woman reveals uh, that she has had a double mastectomy. The young man doesn't know what that means, and she reveals that she's had both of her breasts removed surgically. Look at the consequences of being told that and see what happens as a result. Finally, when you're looking at this short story and you're reading it, pay attention not just to the characters and the way they're described, not just to the language and the way that the changes in the language sort of correspond with changes in the story, but pay very close attention to the images, especially the final image. The woman leaves a very particular object on the doorstep of the, uh, of the man's room. And most readers, when they encounter this, have no idea what it means. Don't worry about what it means. Don't worry about it as a symbol. Try to visualize it. 
try to get it exactly right, and then imagine yourself as the young composer, having had the previous evening's events still fresh in your mind, what would you feel like, what would you think seeing this object? And then imagine yourself as the woman, having gone through the rejection by the young composer, what feelings is she feeling and how would those feelings guide her to prepare this particular object? When you think your way into the story that way, the meaning of the, of the object that she leaves him will maybe not be perfectly clear, but you might have a better feeling for why she did this and you might have a better feeling for how he might respond. And I think that's an important thing to do, is not to worry too much about symbols as uh, coded meaning, um, because that's an easy way to ruin a story. Um, worry instead about getting the feeling right. Okay, let's go on to the next story that you'll be reading, and that's John Cheever's Reunion. Um, this is a really great short piece, and I have a, a personal connection with this. Um, I was uh, once one spring... Uh, spent a weekend with some very good friends who were fellow faculty members. Uh, we were up in uh, Pennsylvania. It was quite cold. Um, we'd had a great night the night before, just a marvelous feast, lots of wine and good conversation. And in the morning, we sat on the porch on rocking chairs um, with hot cups of coffee, and I read this story aloud to my friends. Um, my wife thinks that I'm an absolute nerd for, for taking pleasure in that, but there it goes. Um, Cheever is a noted short story writer. He's a noted realist um, in that he's trying to depict you know, the real world and real events within it. Um, most of his stories are set in a kind of 1940s, 1950s era uh, setting, maybe earlier. And this particular one, um, a lot of this story is working below the surface. And you may have heard this term before, the iceberg principle. Um, it, it comes to us from Ernest Hemingway, uh, the American novelist, who said that a good story operates like an iceberg. Nine-tenths of its body is below the surface. Notice where it is taking place. It's in Grand Central Station. Notice the circumstances. It's a reunion between a son who has been estranged from his father uh, after uh, the father's divorce from his mother uh, for about three years. And the narrator will tell us that this is the story of the last time he saw his father. But notice then if, if we sort of have those somewhat tragic circumstances hinted at, um, you might be very surprised at what happens during the interaction between these two characters. Try to laugh at it, because it's actually really funny. Um, the, the father is uh, boisterous. That's the word that gets used multiple times. Um, he's a little obnoxious, but he's entertainingly obnoxious. Uh, they go to a series of restaurants, um, and they, they either uh, are dissatisfied with them or actually get kicked out of them uh, because of the way that the father interacts with the waiters. You might ask yourself why the father is doing this. What is compelling him to treat the different wait staff um, this way. He's calling them out by um, terms in French and German and Italian. Um, he's mocking uh, the restaurants that they work in. Um, he's making lots of jokes. You should notice that the son never says anything until the very end. Um, but if you get to the motives of the characters, you might start thinking about some things. Like if the father himself is trying to reconnect with his son. Might that explain why he's trying so hard in these different restaurants um, with obviously disastrous results at times? The son will actually at one point speak of his father as my future and my doom. And you should recognize that he's telling this story after his father's death, which means that he's the young, the, the young man who's narrating the story. He has lived some of his life already, and recognizes in himself something of his father. And now we're getting an illustration of aspects of his father. Presumably these are aspects that the son himself identifies within himself. 
You may also um, notice just um, for fun that the father keeps uh, promising the son things. Um, he, he wants to take him uptown to his club. Um, he wants to uh, show him a good time, um, but, but fails to. Think about the poignancy of that. Um, I think that this is a great place for, for you to understand Cheever's art. Um, this is very human. It's very warm. Um, these men, or at least the father, they're failures in one sense, and yet they're striving, and yet they're also quite comic. Um, we're not getting a story of, of knights and dragons. Uh, we're getting a story of a father and a son trying to reconnect in a train station. And that's a very modern experience in that nobody really feels at home. Everybody's out of place, and yet they're trying. Finally, um, the third story that I've asked you to read is Mary Hood's How Far She Went. Um, this is a story I've known for a long time, and I regularly teach this when I teach fiction writing in my creative writing classes. Um, I, I genuinely love this story. And the reasons why I really love it, one of the main reasons at least, is that it illustrates what conflict is in a short story. Um, a lot of students, when they write short stories, they do a good job of creating a character or evoking a setting. Um, maybe the, they're good at uh, writing dialogue that is believable, but their characters remain flat on the page. They don't, they don't do much. And the heart of conflict is when a character desires an outcome but has to pay something to achieve it. And conflict becomes emotionally intense when the cost of achieving the desire that the character desires is almost equal to the value of what they have to sacrifice. So in this story, we have a grandmother and her granddaughter. That's who we're introduced to at first. And we don't know initially what the circumstances are, but we know that uh, we eventually find out that the granddaughter is there, supposed to be there temporarily, um, but that her father ev eventually ends up leaving her there uh, to be taken care of by the grandmother. Uh, the grandmother is immediately evoked as a kind of uptight uh, person, uh, somewhat scolding. Um, we hear this in just the choice of language, really in the first paragraph. Uh, we get words like quarreled, squalled, boiled dishcloth, uh, pinched sling, slap, and then later uh, Hood will describe the perpetual eclipse of disappointment on the grandmother's face. Um, She's, she's immediately presented to us as a character that um, we ourselves might not like. And she and her granddaughter are instantly seen as two characters who are disconnected. And you should also notice that, that stories tend to work this way. Um, if they start at a certain point, they need to end at a different point. So if characters start connected, then by the end of the story, they need to be disconnected. Um, if they begin disconnected by the end of the story, we expect them to have come together. Um, if you go back to the Haas story, uh, the two characters initially seem to be very much united. They spend a lot of time together. There's clearly a budding romance. By the end of the story, they are as far apart as they could possibly be. Reunion is a tricky one. Um, reunion begins by mentioning the disconnection from the father, but over the course of the story, the son and the father... Um, are together the whole time until they have to separate at the end. Here in Mary Hood's story, there's a huge distance between the granddaughter and uh, the grandmother. Um, the first thing we see the granddaughter doing is, is running up the drive away from the house. And what's interesting about that is that Hood describes that as uh, having gone only as far as she dared. So you'll notice maybe a connection with um, hubris. Um, and the notion of limits that we brought up when we were discussing Greek tragedy. Right? There's a certain limit that a character, that any person might have. You can only go so far. And if you go past that limit, well, then all sorts of tragedies can result. The girl runs off from the house. 
and disappears for a short period of time. The grandmother then uh, goes about her business, um, and she herself is, uh, we're going to find out, not married. We are also going to find out that um, her own child, her daughter, uh, was born of some kind of um, affair. Uh, she was not married to the father of her daughter, and that her daughter was born um, and, and raised really without without real love. The, the mother, uh, sorry, the grandmother really never loved um, her child. Uh, the child's name is Sylvie. Um, she's the mother of the granddaughter. She's actually the only named character in the whole story. So, Grandmother and granddaughter disconnected. Granddaughter runs off. We don't we don't know where, but you know she's a teenager. She's off getting in trouble, probably like you. Um, and the grandmother goes to a gravesite. It's the gravesite of her daughter, and she's tending to it. It gives her a chance to reflect on um, the nature of her relationship and the lack of love her daughter might have felt. And she's accompanied by uh, a small white dog, who seems to be her closest companion. And you can notice some things about this dog. Um, it's very faithful. Uh, we hear, for instance, uh, that he could be counted on. He barked all the way. Um, that suggests to you that he's a really reliable little guy. It also tells you that he's not capable of changing. Now, dogs don't really change, but the, the key is we know that he's always going to be a barker. He's always going to be with the grandmother. And that's a critical point in the overall plot. The um, granddaughter shows up. She has managed to get herself uh, together with two um, bikers, uh, and you have to kind of um, think back to you know, I don't know '70s film with uh, Fonda, uh, Peter Fonda, uh, Easy Rider. Picture picture guys like this right there. They're sort of no good guys um, driving around on bikes. And the grandmother um, sees them and chases after them uh, in order to separate her granddaughter from uh, these two men uh, because she knows that the granddaughter is wild like her mother and is probably up to no good. Um, and she tells the men that uh, the girl is underage. The girl is, as any teenager is when they don't get what they want, uh, very, very upset. Uh, but they drive off together. But as they're driving off and they pass by the churchyard, the cemetery where the girl's mother is buried, um, when, they, when they get past that, they actually run into the men again. And the men uh, have been um, looking for them and now are going to chase them and do something to them. Uh, one of the men pulls out a pistol and starts to point it towards the window. Um, so the, the grandmother drives off and eventually runs through the woods but the truck gets stalled, um, and they have to get out and run away. They are being pursued by the men, and they run to a cabin that they know of, and this is where the, the critical decision happens in the story. Um, it's an abandoned cabin. The, the granddaughter notices um, that down on the lake near the place there is actually a pier, so they run there, and they go under it. They're going to hide under that in the water. And um, while they go there, uh, we, we hear that um, the, the grandmother recognizes the dog is not going to stop barking. The dog is with them. And uh, Hood writes that the woman did what she had to do. And she makes a, what must be a very, very painful decision and choice, right? She wants her granddaughter to survive in order to make her granddaughter survive, in order to make that happen, she's going to have to pay a terrible price. Now, you may not care about the, the, what happens to a dog or to you know, this fictional couple uh, who don't even get named, but what I, what I hope you notice in terms of the drama of the story is that, you know, as I said, these are two characters who you maybe don't feel much connection with initially, but you start to recognize the power of, uh, of, the, of the situation that Hood has created for them and the choice that the grandmother has to make and the cost um, that she's going to have to pay in order to get what she wants. And what she wants is to love her granddaughter and to protect her. And she will make uh, a very valiant sacrifice. Um, 
at the end of the story, then back to the idea of how we move from disconnection to connection, um, we hear that the, uh, the the grandmother says to her granddaughter, um, it was him or you, I know that, I'm not going to rub your face in it. And then the narrator says, they saw each other as well as they could in that failing light, in any light. And as they go back, the granddaughter is following right behind her grandmother, close enough to to touch her if the grandmother needs that. And that's a moment of very, very powerful connection. And we'll take time to, to discuss the sort of tactile quality of that, right? She's almost touching her. Anyway, those are the three stories that we're going to look at this week. So you can read them uh, one at a time. You can read them all at a single go. Uh, but notice a couple of things in all of them. Notice a movement uh, from connection or disconnection to its opposite. Notice the way that characters get paired up with each other. Notice the way in which maybe seemingly minor details about the characters tell us rather significant things about them. They suggest rather significant things. Um, notice also how shifts in the language, right? When, when we go from uh, very poetic modes to very prosaic modes, or in the reunion story, when we switch into, ultimately into a couple of sentences in Italian, like why that happens, what's going on when a character changes his voice that way. Um, and back to the, the iceberg principle, the sense that nine-tenths of the story is operating below the surface. That does not mean that these stories are code. You're not, you're not searching for some hidden meaning. What you're trying to do is open yourself up to depths of feeling and of experience that may not be available to you, right? You may never have experienced this kind of disconnection from a person. You may never have rejected a person the way that the young composer does. Um, you may never have you know, strived to reconnect with somebody the way the father does in reunion or have made a sacrifice the way the grandmother does in how far she went. Uh, but if you can stay open to the way the writing calls up that kind of emotion, the stories ought to get very interesting. Okay, 22 minutes, I'm out of here.